Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Your topic tonight is, which Bible is right for you? Your speaker is actually author of three different books. The first book was By Divine Order, which is Biblical Numerics. His second book, also very popular, is the King James Code. This is dealing with codes that are found in the King James Bible only. And then the ba Babel Conspiracy is dealing with 9-11 and how it ties together with different Bible codes. Also an interesting subject. He has been a pastor for 14 years. He's also a well-received Bible prophecy speaker. And he's been studying this particular topic for over six years. Will you help me welcome your speaker, Pastor Michael Hoggard. Thank you. God bless. Welcome Thank you. Andy. God bless you. Glad, Glad to be here again. I'm not proud to be here. I'm humbled to be here. And any opportunity to open up God's Word uh, for any of God's people, I consider it an honor and a blessing, something that I believe was sent down from heaven. As I've shared uh, with uh, Brother Stan and several other people this week, um, and even in the presentations that I've done so far, I'm a pastor, and I have the heart of a pastor, and my heart is for the church and churches. Anywhere they meet, in any location, any situation, that's where my heart is. And I want God's people to be God's people, and I want them to be equipped. I want them to know what the Bible says and what's going on in the world today. And um, several years ago, God called me into the ministry of Bible prophecy, studying prophecy from the old book. And uh, I admit at that time, I did not know that I would actually be standing in front of pulpits all across the country actually defending the Bible in churches. I did not know that that was going to happen, but I believe that God knew that. And um, I have just become convinced, and um, you will probably see as we move forward in the presentation tonight, that um, I believe that God's Word has been inspired. I believe that it's been preserved. I believe it's been translated. And I believe that what I hold in my hand right here is none other than the inerrant Word of God. I'm going to try to, as best as I can, to lay out a scriptural framework for that, to show you line upon line, precept upon precept, why I believe what I believe. The Bible teaches us that this true source of doctrine, the true source of biblical understanding, the true source of our faith, how it is that we're supposed to act and react in different situations, how it is that we're to be saved, the Bible teaches us that the foundation and the source of that must be the Scriptures. Let me read to you uh, a statement of faith, and I do this when I do this particular presentation, no matter where I go. I try to read some sort of faith statement. Uh, I am a free will Baptist, and um, I have been, I pastor Bethel Free Will Baptist Church. It's my home church. I've been there almost 30 years now, and uh, it's a delight. And uh, I believe the free will Baptist doctrine, uh, especially the very first doctrine on our books, and it deals with the Holy Scripture. Free Will Baptist Doctrine states that we believe the Holy Scriptures are the Old and New Testament. We believe that they are the, are the inspired, inerrant Word of God. We believe that everything, not just the thoughts of the Scriptures, but the very words of the Scriptures are the infallible, inspired Word of God. If the Bible teaches on science, then what the Bible says about science is inerrant. If the Bible teaches about history, then what the Bible teaches about history is also inerrant, which means there are no mistakes in it whatsoever. Something that I picked up from reading this faith statement of Free Will Baptists in regards to that first issue, the, the Bible doctrine issue, is that when they describe the Bible that they say is inspired and inerrant, they use present tense language. The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is inerrant. And so what that tells me right now is that we are supposed to believe that what we hold in our hand right now, not necessarily what they wrote some 2,000, 4,000 years ago, but what we hold in our hand right now by the use of the present tense language in the faith statement is the Word of God. I have the statement of faith of the Prophecy Club and the Spirit of Prophecy Church. 
And here is what they say concerning the Bible. We believe in the Bible, the King James Version, in its entirety to be the inspired Word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and conduct. Is that what you believe here tonight? Say amen. amen. Now, I'm going to show you some verses up on the screen tonight that this statement, the statement of the particular group I'm a part of, Free Will Baptist, there's a reason why those men wrote those words is that they got that thought and that understanding not from men, but they got it from the scriptures. And that's what I'm going to start to show you tonight. However, I want to sort of, um, I want to get into an, another portion of the Word of God tonight. I want to deal with, I told you this earlier on this week, I'm a conspiracy guy. I believe in a conspiracy, don't you? I don't believe that, that uh, it, things just happen. I believe that they're controlled. And uh, if you were to ask me what conspiracy theory do I believe in, I believe in the conspiracy that says Lucifer wants to sit on God's throne. Where do I get that from? I get that from the Holy Scriptures. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to see from the very Word of God itself what is going on in the world today and what is going on in the church. Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to pick the story up in verse 12. The Bible says in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, who is Lucifer? Who is this person called Lucifer here? It's the devil, isn't it? Do you believe that? Say amen. You would be surprised at the number of theologians, Bible colleges, pastors, so-called Christian leaders that are no longer saying that Lucifer is the appropriate title of the devil. They're trying to get away from that, and later on in this presentation, I'm going to show you why they're getting away from that. But I believe it's Lucifer. And by the way, even the Satan worshipers know that this is the devil's name, Lucifer. Amen? They may not have anything else right, but they've got that one right. So how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, and God has the ability to look into the heart. Remember when Jesus was there, when he came to earth and ministered, the Bible over and over says that he perceived their hearts. He knew what was going on in their mind. And so God is able to read the thoughts of Lucifer. Thou hast said in thine heart, number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, there's something I want you to notice here is the, the resolve that is in the devil's heart. He actually believes. He's not saying, I'm going to try to ascend into heaven. He's not saying that I'm going to uh, attempt to do these things. His resolve is based upon his pride in that he really thinks that he can accomplish these things. You know, it's a shame that when you tell so many lies so many times that you actually end, end up believing the very lies that you created. And that's exactly what's going on here in the text is that the devil is believing the very lies that he created. And so he says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, according to the scriptures, you can study this out. Stars are indicative of angelic creatures. When, the, when you see the stars falling from heaven, the Bible talks about the heavenly host. Uh, the Bible talks about the stars of God, the morning stars sang out unto, unto the Lord in the book of Job. So stars indicate angels. So what is he saying by this? He's saying, I must dominate the heavenly realm. He, he, he's knowing that he must assume God's position. God's position is stated for us in the scriptures as he calls himself the Lord of hosts. What that means is, is that God is the captain of the army. Somebody say amen. God is the captain and the general of the army. And the devil knows that in order to win the war, he must take control of the army. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So in Revelation 12, that's exactly what we see going on. There is a war in heaven, and the devil and his angels are fighting Michael and his angels. And I like, boy, I just like how that all ends up because it says that 
the devil, the dragon, drew a third of the stars down from heaven with him, which basically means that the devil had one third of the whole angelic realm. Now, I don't know how many angels there are. The Bible says it's an innumerable amount of angels, and I know that it must be a huge, vast amount. And so I'm assuming that one third of the heavenly angels on Lucifer's side has got to be a lot of angels. Somebody say amen. But did you know, you remember what Elisha the prophet told his servant there when they were encompassed there by the enemy? He said, God opened his eyes. He said, hope that he sees that they that are with us are more than they that are with them. And so you know what? I just do a little math here. I'm the math guy, the Bible math guy. And so you know what I see in this? I see that one third is still less than the other two thirds that God's got on his side. Amen. So it just sounds like to me that he's outnumbered already. I like that. But anyway, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to conquer the domain of heaven. Now, number three, he says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I want you to notice the verb sit here because he uses it. There, well, he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And then he says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. When you sit, you sit in a seat and the, the most prominent seat that we see in the scriptures is the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant, what we call the mercy seat. So I believe that he is trying to gain control of the very throne of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now for correct interpretation of what that means, we take our Bible, we turn over to Psalm chapter 48. And we see, we let scripture interpret scripture, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So we're going to pick out a little here, pick out a little there. And the Bible's going to tell us what it means when it says something. He said, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And in Psalm uh, chapter 48, verse 2, the Bible says, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. So the devil is saying here in Isaiah 14 when he says, I will sit in the mount of the congregation. And by the way, the word congregation is a church term. Whenever you see the congregation, it's referring to God's people. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. It's a title that implies the church. And there we see the connection between this mount of the congregation in the sides of the north and Mount Zion being in the sides of the north. Mount Zion is also a picture of the congregation of the Lord. So what is the devil trying to tell us there? What is it that God looked in in his heart and saw what was going on in there? The devil said, I must control the church. Do you believe that? I must control and dominate God's people. I must, in fact, if just kind of look at it to, as far as a, a, a biblical historical level, God back in Genesis 12 and in, in following chapters, God promised Abraham this territory that we call Canaan land. He promised that that would be his forever and ever and ever. God then took Abraham out of that land and put him in a different place. And lo and behold, the devil's people just went in there and they took custody of Canaan land. And when Joshua went in fighting that battle, God made sure that Moses and the Israelites knew that he wasn't sending Israel in because they were so good and that because they were all righteous, holy people. God said that he's sending them in there to, to run Canaan or the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Perizzites out of that land because they were trespassing on God's inheritance. And so what we see here is the devil's attempt. Now let me just ask you this. Do you think the devil has any business coming to church? He's not going to get saved, is he? Amen? The devil and all his devils, are, they're not going to get saved. They do not have the ability to be redeemed. And so what business do they have coming into our churches? What business does the devil have coming into our homes? What business does the devil have coming into our marriages and trying to ruin our children? We ought not let him in. Somebody say amen. amen. We ought not let him in. He's trespassing on the inheritance that God has given his people. And I tell you what, if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, you'll see that's exactly what went on. Was, that was the story of Goliath and the Philistines. And the Bible says that the Philistines put themselves, I can't remember what city it was or what place it was, but the Bible says which it said it belonged to Judah. So you know what that means? The Philistines were trespassing on Judah's ground. 
And let me tell you something, that when the devil starts trespassing in your church, when he starts coming into your marriage, when he starts trying to get into your home and get your children, hey, when he starts trying to come into our country, he's trespassing. I think the fight ought to be on. Hey, somebody say amen. I think the fight ought to be on. Well, we see here that he's trying to control and dominate the church. He must, now, the, the interesting thing is, even though there's five things here that he says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, the thing is, God says, you won't, you won't, you won't, you won't, you won't. Amen? Because I'm not on the losing side here. I'm on God's side, and I believe, I, see, I peeked at the back of the book, we win. Amen? God wins. He gets the victory. So everything that the devil said that he will... God says, oh, no, you won't. You know, it, and, and you know what? He is trying to control and manipulate and dominate the church. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Somebody say amen. amen. But you know what? That's not stopping him from trying. That's not stopping him from, in many cases, succeeding can we not agree that the devil has gotten preachers churches ministries denominations and over and over and over the devil is he's making ground i mean he's making headway here he's doing what he said that he was going to do but just remember, God always has a remnant. Amen? He always has a remnant. So we understand now that the devil is trying to control the church. He's trying to get into the church and trespass. And he must dominate that thing on his, in his attempt to sit on God's throne and reign over that. And so that's primarily what I'm going to be dealing with tonight. I'm going to show you a few things on how... He's doing it, but primarily, primarily, he's using one thing in particular, and that thing was mentioned all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, and I call this the Hegelian dialect, transforming the church, and I'm going to explain to you what that means here just in a moment. But I want you to look at the, the verses there up on the screen and read along with me there, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? In verse 16, he says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now I want you to look, if we kind of look backward at these verses again, just kind of, kind of see in your mind what God's trying to say here. God's saying that, number one, we ought not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers and what God is doing in these series of verses here is that he's he's showing us that there are differences between this over here and this over here and so he says number one what fellowship hath righteousness over here with unrighteousness is there anything that is I mean is there any fellowship between righteousness and unrighteousness Absolutely not. And God said there is always a difference. There is always a difference between his way and the world's way. If you want to just a good Bible study, go through the scriptures and mark down what is God's way and what is world's way. Did you know that we're so guilty a lot of times, and I'm just going to preach a little bit. You know, we're so guilty a lot of times of, of in our marriages there is God's way and then there's the world's way and we end up following just about everything that the world tells us to do in our marriage, whether we're going to stay married or get split up or anything like that and yet I think we need to be looking at God's way, amen? Raising children, there's God's way, there's the world's way. How to, have, how to conduct church services, there's God's way, there's the world's way. How to live, how to deal with your boss at work, how to be a boss at work, there's God's way and then there's the world's way. 
and they don't communicate. They don't fellowship. What communion hath light with darkness? Does light and darkness ever communicate? Do they ever commune? Do they ever get along? No, you see, in God's world, it's either one way or the other way. Somebody say amen. It's either one way or the other way. He said Christ with Belial. Is there any, was there ever, an, watch this, was there ever an agreement between Jesus and the devil? Now stop and think about this. What was the devil trying to do when Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness? What was the devil trying to do there? He was trying to get him to agree with him. He said, see all these cities, all these kingdoms? I'll give them to you if you'll worship me. He was trying to get Jesus to agree to his terms. And it says here that there is no agreement, no concord, no contract between Jesus and the devil. In fact, let me kind of put it this way. If I were to use this term, if I, if I say Jesus Christ, do you have that? that's a good name. Somebody say amen. It's in the Bible. What if I said Jesus Lucifer? How does that sound to you? No, no, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? Because you can't mix one with the other. Let me give you another illustration. I want to show you how God sees this thing. If I had, uh, let's see, I have a glass of water here. If this glass of water here was absolutely nothing but H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, no chemicals, no additives, no minerals, no anything, it was absolutely 100% pure water. How many of you would like a drink of this? Say, man, it's good stuff. It'll do you some good. All right, now, let's say that I had a glass over here, and I went out here after a, a, a spring rain, and I scooped up some old sludge, dirt, mud water, and I had it in this glass here. Now, how many of you would like to drink out of this glass? And the answer is no, I don't want anything to do with it, okay? And isn't that interesting that God has made righteousness clean and he's made sin dirty, amen? I mean, God made it that way. And by the way, sin stinks too, doesn't it, amen? All right, now watch this, okay? If I were to take a drop of this perfectly clean water and put it over here into this unclean water, have I purified the dirty water? No. no. However, if I take a drop of this dirty water and put it into this clean water, what have I done? I have contaminated the clean water. So you know what? God, God's right in what he says. He says, you don't mix. You don't mix the devil with Jesus. You don't mix righteousness with unrighteousness. You don't mix uh, uh, the temple of God with the temple of idols. They don't mix. There is to never be a proper mixture of the two. Does everybody understand that concept so far? Now watch this. God said in Jeremiah chapter 51, he said, flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. You know why? Because Babylon represents the wicked world system and God says, I don't want my people in Babylon. So he says, get out, we don't mix, right? You're not going to Babylon to purify Babylon. You're in Babylon and Babylon is corrupting you. Somebody say amen. amen. So there, so God says, come out of Babylon. Deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Now, I want you to get this picture. I want you to see what God's saying here. God is saying, he says that Babylon is a golden cup in the Lord's hand. And so I want you to understand what the Bible means by this. The Bible means by this that God is using Babylon. God is using false prophets. God is using the wickedness of the world. God is using the devil, by the way. God is using um, oh, all of the evil, terrible things, the Babylonian church and all this stuff. God is using that stuff to separate who's his and who is not. Why did he allow Satan to go into the garden? Because God gave man something that he didn't give any of the other creation. He gave man choice. 
I believe in choice, don't you? I believe that's what separates us from all the... And so God didn't take the tree of knowledge of good and evil and hide it away on some mountain somewhere that was almost impossible to get to. God put it right in the middle of the garden. And the tree of life on one side and the tree of literally death on the other. And all over the scriptures, God gives us a choice. And he says, choose life. Amen? Choose life. So he told Adam and Eve, choose. And then God sent a tempter in to determine what was in the hearts of people. And so Babylon is that golden cup in the Lord's hand. And what that means is, is that God one of these days is going to allow Babylon, if you look in Revelation 17, there it is, Revelation, there it is. God is going to allow Babylon to pour her cup of fornication and drunkenness out on this earth as a form of judgment. And in that, God is saying, okay, if you really don't want to believe what I say, then I'm not going to give you what I say. I'm going to give you a false thing in its place. 2 Thessalonians 2.11, God says, for God shall send them strong delusion. That's Babylon with that, that wine of drunkenness in her hand. And by the way, drunken wine and strong drink in the Bible are the equivalent of false doctrines. Notice what Leviticus says. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between clean and unclean. Notice what's being said here. He says that when the priests go in, and if they are drunk on wine and strong drink, then what God said is clean, and what he said is unclean, the priests won't be able to know the difference, will they? Wow. He said that which is holy and unholy, if the priests are drunk, they will not be able to tell the difference between that which is holy and that which is unholy. And so you know what they're going to do? They're going to mix the two. Because of spiritual false doctrine drunkenness. Notice what the book of Proverbs says. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived, notice the wording here, deceived thereby is not wise. These things equal false doctrine. Isaiah 28, 7, 8. But they have also erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. So the Bible is laying a foundation for us that wine and strong drink equal a false doctrine and a false doctrine system that has, not will in the future, but has already made its way into the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice that God is putting a difference between one and the other. God is saying drunkenness is wrong. How many of you believe that? Hey, listen, I'm still an old-fashioned preacher that believes it's wrong to drink liquor. Amen? I think it's wrong to drink that stuff. You don't have that stuff in your house. Some, boy, somebody say amen to that. All right, now, God says it's wrong. And so God says drunkenness is over here and being filled with the Spirit is over here. And he said, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And you never mix the two. Amen? You never mix the two. And then, you know, talks about speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know what I get out of that? I get out of that that when you get full of God's Spirit, God will give you a sweet song in your heart. Somebody say amen. Boy, I like that. Now watch this. Paul warned the church. He warned the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He was warning the church. He was not only warning them then, then, but he's warning them now. And he said, but I fear, lest by any means as. And in the other videos, we talked about certain words in the Bible. And that word as is very, very strong. It's a very strong word. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. That means go back and look at how the devil did it to Eve. And how did the devil seduce Eve? How did he get her to not be able to tell the difference between what God said and what he said? 
We're going to find that out tonight. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, number one, another Jesus, number two, another spirit, or number three, another gospel. Did you know that there's a false gospel out there? Let me tell you what this false gospel is. It is anything that re, it is to any degree removed from the true gospel. And the true gospel is that we are saved by grace through faith and not by works. Somebody say amen. You are not saved by your works. You're not saved by your intellect. You're not saved by the money you put in, nor your church membership. You are saved by the grace of Almighty God alone through faith. That is the true gospel. Anything to any degree less than that is a false gospel. It's another gospel. And so we're going to deal with this tonight as the serpent beguiled Eve because he was already working on transforming. You see, Eve is a woman, and women in the Bible represent churches. They represent the church. And so Paul is warning us now as the church to not fall into the same trap that Eve fell into. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 11, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now here again, we have God's true men, God's true leaders, God's true prophets, God's true preachers, and then we have false prophets over here, false teachers and false preachers, and they have decided to mingle and transform themselves. And no marvel, verse 14, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now I'm gonna teach you, I titled this the Hegelian dialect and it's transforming the church. And, and uh, I know some of the Prophecy Club students uh, or students of prophecy in general have probably heard of the Hegelian dialect. They may have seen it before. They may kind of know what it is, but I'm gonna just kind of break it down for you just so that you'll understand what I'm talking about when I use this. Let me, let me see if I can explain it this way. Uh, uh, up on the screen you see thesis plus antithesis or antithesis and an equal synthesis. Let me kind of tell you what that means. Let's say that, uh, let's say the brother over here, he believes the Bible, he believes that it's the inspired word of God, and he believes what God said, that God created the earth in six days, and they were 24-hour days, because the Bible said the evening and the morning were the first day, and so he believes that roughly 6,000 years ago, uh, God created the heavens and the earth and man in six days. And let's say that somebody over here, let's say that uh, they're an atheist, an agnostic, uh, some kind of deist or something like that. They don't hardly believe in God. They don't like to think about it. And they believe this sewer pipe coming into our public schools that we're just all here by evolution. Amen? And they, he believes that over here. And he says that, no, God didn't have anything to do with it, that there was a big explosion in space some, you know, 14 and a half billion years ago. And then, lo and behold, this earth evolved, you know, 2.5 billion years ago. And then there was a pool of goo over here. And in that pool of goo, uh, some chemicals came together, lightning flashed and thunder rolled, and these chemicals came together and it formed a cell. And then it formed a little fish. And then the fish grew hair and a tail. And it formed a monkey. And then the hair fell off. Amen, guys? Amen? The hair fell off and the tail dropped off, and here we stand. You know what? I think you ought to laugh at that nonsense, amen? That is, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Only the devil could come up with something that stupid, amen? I mean, it's just, that you talking about, that. listen, that's not science, it's science falsely so-called, the Bible says. It's actually part of the New Age religion. And I'll show you that tonight, and I'll show you that tomorrow night, that evolution has everything to do with a new world order system being put in this country. That's why it's being taught in our schools. So you have this infidel over here who doesn't believe anything. He just, all oh, a big accident. And you have this man over here who believes in the creation story exactly the way the Bible says. Now, we have thesis over here, and we have the opposite of that, antithesis or antithesis over here. Now, those two ideas, they just can't, mm, they, they don't work, do they? You can't bring them together and have anything that looks like the thesis or the right doctrine. They're not supposed to come together. God said, don't be drunk 
so that you know the difference between clean and unclean. So what happened? Something has happened over the last 50, 75 years so that now coming out of our pulpits, out of our Bible colleges, out of some of our Christian leaders, the idea called theistic evolution. It's a new synthetic doctrine that chooses or wishes to incorporate the principles of God watered down so that they can mix easily with the corruption of hell and you have a new synthetic doctrine that says, yeah, God created the universe, but it took him 15 billion years to do it. Well, I tell you what, that's a slow God. Amen? It doesn't work, does it? And it's wrong. And it's coming out of our pulpits. And it's coming, it, Christian books, Christian leaders. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. You'd be surprised at the people who are saying, maybe this is real. But it's not. Because to any degree you lead the biblical account of the Genesis creation story, you have left the word of God. Amen? Amen. Two contradicting statements or ideas brought together to form a new synthetic doctrine. Let me, um, let me, let me kind of show you how this is at work. It's at work in politics. They're using the, I believe that's what Oklahoma City was all about. See, Oklahoma City was, is what's called a change agent. It's to get Americans who love freedom, who over the years we have a history of as Americans of fighting and spilling our blood and guts for the sake of the freedom that we have in this country. Our forefathers did it. I think we ought to do it. But then you have a new world order system, communist based, out of hell. And the key is to try to get Americans to be communist. It's called the Hegelian dialect. So something has to change. That, listen, the communists are not going to change. Something has to change the patriotic Americans, right? So you blow up a building or two. And you see innocent children killed right on front of your television screen. And it's called a change agent. And then you begin to bring Americans closer to communism. So then right after that, they start passing laws saying, we need to monitor what you're doing. We need to watch over you. We need to regulate this. We need to do that. You see, that, that, the world calls it communism. Bible calls it cruel authority. And let me say this, there's a reason why American is, America is getting what we're getting, is that we've turned our back on God. And when you do, See, the Bible says you're, going to be, you're always going to be under somebody's dominion. You're either going to be under God's dominion or you're going to be under the devil's, and that's all there is to it. So you know what God is doing? God is allowing this nation to be transformed from a godly nation under his control to a nation that's under the control of the devil. We're seeing in the guise of public morality. You talk to old-timers, senior citizens, people 60, 70 years old, and they'll tell you that in their day, they never seen the like of people walking around. They walk. I mean, people undressed and stuff. I mean, it's all over our television screen. There's stuff. Hey, listen, when the sodomites can come out of the closet and get married and, 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 and have those TV shows on and everybody sits at home and laughs at that stuff when 30, 40 years ago that was a curse and you didn't do that, see, something's happened, isn't it? You had decent people who had, who had a moral consciousness and you had this wickedness out of hell. Something was used to change public morality. Commerce. It's going on, right? How many of you remember, I mean, you remember paying 75, 60 cents a gallon for gasoline? Amen? Oh, those were the days, right? Those were the days. Well, you know what? We're so used to not knowing what we pay for gas anymore. It goes up, about, it goes up and down about every two or three weeks, doesn't it? I don't even know what it is right now. Buck 80, buck 70, buck 60, I don't know. It was, it was one price when I left home to come here. It's a totally different price now. So you know what they're getting us? They're getting us to not care about how much it costs. Commerce, advertising. Do you believe that advertising in magazines, commercials, radio are trying to get people to change how they think? Television and film. Oh, yeah television and film, trying to get us to change how we think. So that's the Hegelian dialect at work. Now let me, uh, it, it's working in preaching. It's working in preaching. Now I want you to get this concept. I want you to follow this, okay? Here you have a church. 
A church, according to the scriptures, is to be what God said it was supposed to be. I believe a church ought to be a birthing center. I believe the church ought to be bringing people into the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. I believe, and the Bible says that people are saved by the foolish, that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save people, right? So God has a way that he said this is how it's going to be done, and God said it's through preaching that people should be saved. I'm a preacher. I stand for that. I believe that. I think that we ought to preach in our churches. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, now here's the lost man over here. The lost man doesn't like the preacher. He doesn't like the preaching. You know why? Because he gets under conviction. He's reminded of his sin. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want to change his ways. And so here the church is supposed to preach. The lost man says doesn't preach. So something's going on in our churches now to where now we have churches that don't preach. They'll get up there and they'll give you a little psychology lesson, give you four points on this, seven points on this, how to have a successful marriage, how to do this, how to do that, how to feel good when you leave out of here. And oh, by the way, we're going to pass the plate. Amen? Amen? Oh, boy, don't get me started on that. But anyway... So we have a new style of preaching that's coming out of our churches. And the problem is the lost man stays lost. The lost man stays lost because God's way has been changed into man's way. It's going on in our churches. Purpose, purpose driven. The, I believe that churches ought to be sacred assemblies, don't you? I, hey, I remember a time, and probably you remember a time when churches were holy places. You went to church, and when you was a kid, you sat down, and you kept your mouth shut, and you didn't chew gum and stuff like that. I mean, I know I'm sounding old-fashioned, but that's just how I remember it. That's the way, I mean, church was a holy, holy thing. Amen? I mean, it was supposed to be a sacred assembly. So you know now what we, and the, and the world says, I don't like that. I like entertainment. I like things that'll flash in my eyes. I like big old music going. I like the drums. I like this. I like that. I like a big show. When you, if, if you want me to come to your church, then you're going to have to put on a show for me. And oh, by the way, because I'm lost, I have a sin nature. And the show that you put on last month is not going to be good enough. It's going to have to be better next month. Isn't that how it is? That's what drives Hollywood, isn't it? Hollywood knows that they can't make a lesser movie than what they did this year. They have to make it better next year or you won't show up. Uh, the country music, the, the pop music industry, all of the music industries, all the media centers know that what they're doing now is not going to be good enough probably six months from now and it's going to have to be more exciting. What's going on in our television? We've lost the shock value, right? So Janet Jackson has a malfunction on television. Listen, they can tell me all they want to. They didn't know that was going on. I think they're lying through their teeth. Amen? So you know what? You know what the American viewing public is now waiting for? We're waiting for the next worst thing to happen. Television, as a result of this, is not going to get better. It's going to get worse, isn't it? It's all about changing. Turning churches from sacred assemblies to entertainment centers. Everything orchestrated and laid out versus churches. I think churches ought to be spirit-led, don't you? I think that if you have church, you ought to at least invite Jesus to come, and he ought to at least be able to have a say in what goes on in the church. Because, yeah. by the way, it's his church. Amen? Amen? That's what's going on. Let me show you some of, the, uh, some, of, some of what's going on, some of what is being marketed by churches to this lost world. Got casual dress. Notice the, the, the man there, the old man there, God rocks. By the way, let me tell you something. I'm going to just kind of get off on this for a moment. I'm, I'm one of these guys that, uh, I don't know, I just, I, some things are just wrong to me. And this whole idea about rock and roll and stuff like that, I, re I remember learning, and it's still true. You can go research it and look it up. The term rock and roll was a slang term that they used to talk about sexual activity in the back of a car. 
That's where the term came from. I'm not making this up. That's where the term came from. And when you tell me God rocks, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. They're trying to characterize, you see on the bottom of the screen, they're trying to characterize a, a traditional religion or traditional churches or churches that are still preaching the way they ought to as long-faced religion. That there's no life in that. that there's nothing going on there. So, they're, so all the churches now, they're trying to get away. They're trying to advertise to the lost world that we have changed what we're doing and we're going to try to accommodate you. I don't know. Things like, it's too boring, I don't have time. You notice the young lady there, there's a caption there. I'm going to show you what, this is being marketed to lost people from churches. She said, when I walked out of my parents' church, I never thought I'd walk back in. For me, church was all about rules, uncomfortable clothes, and trying to stay awake. It was watching my parents act like saints on Sunday and sinners the other six days. If that was church, you could have it. I had moved on in my life. I didn't need church. That's why it was so strange that as an adult, I found myself really wanting a spiritual facet to my life. I want you to get what she's trying to convince the lost man of. She's trying to say that for years, everybody that sat in church now were all hypocrites. And they weren't, I mean, you can just forget about going to any church that still believes the old time way and believes the old King James Bible and will preach against sin and name sin. By the way, I'm, I'm a preacher, I believe in naming sins, Amen. You preach against sin specifically. Lost man doesn't want to hear that. So now the churches are marketing to the lost man, if you come to our church, we won't preach on sin. My heart is burdened, people. My heart is burdened. Because unless the sinner comes to face to face with his sin and repents, he cannot be saved. Is that biblical? Absolutely. Absolutely. If confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So the church, who for years tried to get the lost man to come face to face with his sins, now the church is saying, if you come to our church, we won't mention it. And we'll still tell you that you're a Christian. Something's gone wrong here. A church that is doing this, I'll... Uh, kind of speed this up a little bit. They say, what on earth am I here for? This is from their website. What is my blueprint for living life? What drives my life? You may have felt in the dark about your purpose in life. Congratulations, you're about to walk into the light. During this Lenten season, we'll spend 40 days in small groups examining many life questions and take a look at what it means to lead a purpose-given life. Now, that sounds all real good, but here's the rest of what this church says on their website, what they stand for. They say that we are a church of inclusion. This is a value Jesus held. We believe Jesus came to include, not exclude. Hold on a minute. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I didn't come. He said, I come to bring a sword. Jesus said, I come to turn a man at variance against his father and his mother. He said, unless you abandon all those and come and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Notice what they say under liberation. We are a people of liberation. We seek to challenge all oppression, particularly the oppression of who? Queer people. That is their wording from their website. By embodying grace, we live out our liberation until all are set free. So now it's got to the point to the, that the church is now saying it's okay to be a sodomite and you can still go to heaven. That's where we're at. Now let me move on. Music, sacred music versus rock and roll. I won't deal with that tonight. Let me move on. Let me talk about how the Hegelian dialect is working the Bible translation issue. The, let's, let's take this man over here for an example. He believes that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It has no errors in it whatsoever. There are zero mistakes in the Bible, and everything that he reads in this book came down from heaven. Do you believe that? Say amen. Now, here's a man over here who he just, he sees the book and the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales uh, or he might believe that some of it came from God or whatever or it's, it's, it's a book of good principles, but it's not the word of God. So this idea over here says it's the word of God. This idea over here says that it's not the word of God. And when you take these two things and you meld them together, you have a new synthetic doctrine about the Bible and it's characterized by the following quotations. Each translation has the power to transform your life. The voice of God can speak to you through each one. Always use more than one translation. 
Let the Lord speak to you through more than one voice. All versions can help us to hear the voice of God. The Bible is not what it appears to be. It has no single author representing a uniform and consistent point of view. Oh, yes, it does. It does have one single author, doesn't it? God. And it is one consistent point of view. And they say, let all, what they're telling you is, you get out about 10 different Bible translations when you're studying the scriptures, or since the books are too big, we'll sell you some software that has 14 different Bible translations on it and transliterations and all this stuff. And then somewhere, somewhere, you will be able to accurately hear, maybe, what God's saying. That's a new synthetic doctrine concerning the Bible. Here's how that works out. Let me show you what the Bible says. Thy word is very pure. Do you believe that? Say amen. Therefore thy servant loveth it. Psalm 119, thy word is true from where? Beginning. Do you believe Genesis 1? Do you believe that God created the earth in six days? Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt, notice the future tense. From this point, David was saying, it will always be preserved. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now I'm going to get into what I'm going to do for you tonight is I'm going to put up here on the screen. I'm going to show you the differences. They say get out many translations. So what I'm going to do for you tonight is I'm going to show you the King James translation on one side and some of the other translations on the other. And then this new synthetic doctrine says that even where they're disagreeing, you should be able to hear God's voice somewhere in the middle. And this changing comes three ways. Number one, changing of the reading. In other words, making it say something completely different. Or number two, omission of part of the verse. Or number three, omission of all of a verse. Let me show that. Put it up on the screen. Number one, here's the King James. It says, Hosea 11, Ephraim compasseth me about with lies. And the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. Now what I want you to concentrate on is the fact that Judah rules with God and is faithful. That is what the King James Bible says. The NIV says Judah is unruly against God and against the faithful and holy one. So what you're seeing here is that one of these versions is not telling you the truth, is it? One of these, what they're saying, they are two totally contradictory statements from one Bible to the other, and yet the new doctrine says that we're supposed to hear God's voice somewhere in here. But you know what? God is not the author of confusion. And if one verse says that Judah rules with God and the other verse says that Judah is unruly, which one's right? Well, God's right, but which one did God say? And so you have to make, see, what we're doing is we're saying that there really is no standard for what's right. If you work in the construction industry and you go to the lumber yard to buy pre-cut two-before lumber, that, I guarantee you, that man at that lumber yard is going to know what a pre-cut is. It's a pre-designed, pre-fabricated, it's cut to exact specification. And if I live in St. Louis, and if I were to go to a St. Louis lumber yard or Topeka, Kansas lumber yard and, and, lumber yard and order a pre-cut, I guarantee you they're going to be the exact same size because there's a standard, Right? You know, there's a standard for everything. That, in medical science, there's a standard. In biology, there's a standard. In grocery stores, there's a standard. In gas stations, in, there's a standard. In a pack of cigarettes, there's a standard, right? But for some reason, the most important issue that mankind will ever deal with, the salvation of his soul, for some reason, there's no standard. We've replaced the Word of God. Now, Genesis 22, 2, King James, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Now this is very, very important. The King James says that God told Abram to offer him. The NIV has God telling Abraham to sacrifice him. Is there a difference? Follow the steps of Abraham now. If God told him to offer him, Abraham takes his son, lays him on the altar, and does exactly what God told him to do because he offered him there. 
If God, however, told him to sacrifice him, then what Abraham must do, in spite of who he hears from, he must take that child, lay it on the altar, draw back that knife, and plunge it into his body and kill him because God said to do it. And you remember the story. The angel of the Lord showed up and said, Abraham, don't touch your son. Don't put your knife to him. Don't kill him. Now, hold on a minute. Watch this. God said, kill him. An angel says not to kill him. Who are we supposed to believe? And by the way, if God said, kill your son, the Bible is clear. God doesn't change. God would not go back and say, now, Abraham, don't kill your son. What, what, you didn't mean it? Were you lying, God, when you told me to do that? You see the difference? I believe one of them is lying. And yet we're supposed to believe that we can hear the voice of God somewhere in the middle here. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Do you believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? Say amen. amen. Okay? That's the King James. The RSV says a young woman will conceive. Now, I don't know what it's like in Topeka, Kansas, but where I come from, young women are conceiving all the time. And that's not anything miraculous, is it? In fact, it's a shame what's going on. And so, you know what? They have removed the virgin birth doctrine of Jesus Christ right out of the Bible. And yet, we're supposed to believe that you can hear God's voice in here somewhere. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. What this is saying is that the Jesus, the Messiah, who was born in Bethlehem, he didn't have his origin in Bethlehem. He never had an origin. He was everlasting to everlasting. Jesus said, I always was, always am, and always will be. Do you believe that? Say amen. He always was. Now watch this. The New International Virgin says that he has an origin. And an origin is a beginning. And you know what the devil knows? The devil knows what we know, that things that have a beginning have a what? Mm. Stop and think about what's going on. And yet we're supposed to believe that we can hear God's voice here. And Matthew 18, and said, verily, verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, ye be converted. And become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That is what the King James says. Notice what the NIV says. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change. Now, what is the difference here? I didn't convert myself. I didn't save myself. I didn't wash my own sins away. Who did it? God did. Jesus did. He did it for me. Because I couldn't do it for myself. And yet the NIV has Jesus saying that you need to change. And isn't that what most lost people believe anyway? They say, well, you know, I would like to come to your church, but I tell you what, I'd be a hypocrite if I came. Hey, come sit down next to the rest of the hypocrites. Amen? Because you know what? You cannot clean up your life. Only God can. For God so loved the, hey, say this verse with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know one of the, how many of you just know that verse by heart? Say amen. amen. Boy, and you know why? Because when you were growing up, you went to a church and everybody in all the churches had one Bible and it was the old King James Bible. And they taught you scripture memorization from one Bible. So you know what's going on now in the church? And by the way, David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. I guarantee you, you put enough Bible verses in there, it'll keep you away from sin. Amen? So you know what's going on in the church right now? Nobody can memorize Scripture because they don't know what version to memorize them from. A teacher in a Sunday school class cannot lead students to memorize Scriptures because they're all using different Bibles. They've taken the word of God out of the hearts of these children. Notice that the focus here is on that he gave his only begotten son. That is a verb that means what it says, that Jesus came forth from the Father. And so the New English Version has omitted begotten and just calls him his only son. The RSV calls him his only son. He's omitted begotten. The NIV, his one and only son, it has omitted the doctrine of the begetting of the Father of Jesus Christ. It's taken it completely out, and yet we're supposed to believe we can hear God's voice in here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It says all scripture, so you know what that means? Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, God gave it. Now I want you to notice this first. I like this because it says all scripture is 
given. You know what that? My English teacher taught me that is a present tense. It doesn't say that all scripture was given. And you know what? I didn't read the Bible 2,000 years ago. I read the Bible now. And so you know what this tells me? That when I read the scriptures, the Holy Ghost of God is giving me the inspiration of God. Right here, right now, is given. Now watch this. The New English Version says every inspired scripture has its use. It's saying that not all the scripture is inspired. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You believe that? Say amen. That's the King James. The NIV says he appeared in a body. Who? But it doesn't say God, does it? And to the degree that you remove the deity of Christ from Christ, oh, well, I'll show you that in a minute who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is what caused our deliverance and our justification. However, the new King James Version says he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. It is removing what Jesus did as part of our salvation experience. And yet we're supposed to believe that God's voice can be heard in here somewhere. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Even the corruption of the word of God was going on in Paul's day. So the NIV says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Oh yeah, they do. In fact, that's why they print all these new Bibles all the time. You know why? So they can copyright them. So that if you quote from them, you have to pay them a dime. It's all, see, the Bible says the love of money, love of money is the root of all evil. Notice, and we're supposed to somewhere hear God's voice in here. That same reading is also found in the New King James Version of the Bible. Mark chapter 10. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that do what? Trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. And yet the NIV says how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. I'm telling you it's not hard. Unless you're full of pride. Amen. It's not hard. You know what you do? You call in the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Where's God's voice here? I don't get it. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now we said this was who? We said it was the devil, right? O Lucifer, son of the morning. That's what the King James Bible says. Now watch this. In the NIV, it calls him the morning star. Now, why is that so deadly? This sister got it over here. I'm going to show you something. The King James says in Revelation 22, 6, that Jesus is the morning star. They're saying that Jesus fell from heaven. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He came down because he loved us. God didn't kick him out of heaven. But I know somebody that wishes that Jesus was kicked out of heaven. You hear a conspiracy going on here? Hmm, no wonder. I put up here, no wonder. No wonder what? There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. That means that there ought not be any gays, queers, homosexuals, sodomites in the, I mean, in the land of Israel. Do you believe that? Say amen. God said he wouldn't put up with it. Amen? God said he wouldn't put up with it. Now the NIV says no Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. So no wonder we have sodomites standing behind pulpits. Let me hear you say amen. It's no wonder we have sodomite weddings going on inside the church. Mm. And yet we're supposed to hear God's voice in here somewhere. No wonder. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And there again, it says there were male shrine prostitutes. You'll not find the word sodomite in the NIV. No wonder. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall neither drink wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb, because God says that as soon as that child is conceived in there, it belongs to him, doesn't it? And yet the NIV says he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. And so no wonder it's the churches 
that are telling the politicians, it's okay, abort the babies. And the politicians get to stand in the pulpits of the churches who are pro-choice, which basically means they're pro-murder because the devil had it taken out of the Bible that he can be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. No wonder. Which one? Here's a change in the reading. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Remember, the firstborn things belong to God, don't they? So Jesus must have been the firstborn. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. Notice that the firstborn issue is taken completely out of the scriptures. And Joseph and his mother marveled. I like this because King James got it right. Joseph is not the father of Jesus, was he? He's not the father of Jesus, and yet the NIV says the child's father and mother. They're saying that Joseph was Jesus' father. That's wrong, isn't it? And yet we're supposed to believe. We can hear God's voice in here. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? How many words of God? And when the Bible says every, does it mean every? So you know what? If I don't have every word of God in my hand tonight, how can I live? How can I live? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's the King James. The NIV says man does not live by bread alone, and then it ends it right there. It's omitted the rest of the verse. Hmm. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's the King James. NIV says, Jesus answered, It is written. Wait a minute. Where's the get thee behind me, Satan? I kind of like that, don't you? That shows a little attitude on Jesus' part, doesn't it? Get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. But it's taken out of the Bible now. So how can you have a little attitude with the devil? Amen? Haven't you wanted to do that to him too? Get thee behind me, Satan. Amen? Man, I'll bring the shout out of you here in a minute, all right? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Can you believe in Buddha and be saved? Can you believe in Mohammed and be saved? Can you believe in politics and be saved? Can you believe you'll have another beer and be saved? No. So it says, believeth on me, right? He who believes has everlasting life. That's what the NIV says. Hmm. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of who? See, the Bible's trying to give us a clue how to spot the Antichrist. Because he will not confess that Jesus came in the flesh. And so the NIV says, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. What have they omitted? In the flesh. So let me ask you a question. Where is the spirit of Antichrist in which Bible translation? The NIV. It's there because it did not acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh. This verse is completely gone out of practically every translation of the Bible except the King James and the New King James. It says, Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, I'll tell you this, that that is one place in the Bible that it says it. There's actually two places. And the Bible says, out of the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established. And so the, Jesus was establishing a doctrine of spiritual warfare that when, when some of these foul spirits just won't leave you alone, you know what you do? You pray and you fast because Jesus said that's how it's going to be. And so think about it. The devil's pretty slick, isn't he? He took the keys of spiritual warfare right out of the Bible. Because this verse is completely omitted. NIV, New American Standard, uh, 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 Revised Standard, I mean, you name it. Holman Standard, they're all, this verse is completely gone. This verse is gone. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. That verse is completely gone out of every version, perversion of the Bible, except the King James and the New King James. Matthew 23, 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. You know what Jesus was preaching against? False religion. And putting on a show in church. Jesus was preaching against that, wasn't he? 
And yet that verse is now gone out of the Bible, except the King James. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Here is the evidence right here of the Hegelian dialect now at work in the doctrine of hell. You see, I, I sort of want to pattern myself after the old hellfire preachers. Amen. I like those guys. Amen. They just preached hell was hot. And that saved sinners. And, and the church went for thousands of years believing that hell was hot. But now, for some reason, we've got a new doctrine that's coming out of our pulpits and out of our so-called Christian leaders. And I could stand here and name names of people who believe this, and you'd go, oh, but it's true. That says that hell is not on fire. That the fire is merely a symbol of the separation of God. So hell's not on fire. So we have a, hell's on fire. There is no hell. Now we have a new doctrine that says hell is not on fire. And maybe it has something to do with the fact that the verse that says it is, is gone out of their Bibles. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That verse, gone out of all the new translations except the King James, New King James. I had trouble getting these verses on the screen. There's so many of them. This is Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Now, I'll be honest with you. If you go to the bookstore and buy an NIV, shame on you, number one. But I have one. I bought, and, and let me just tell you where I'm at on this thing. If, eight years ago, if you had asked me, am I going to be standing behind pulpits uh, uh, preaching the King James Bible that it's the Word of God, I'd have told you no, because at that time, I didn't believe it. At that time, I believed what people had told me that the Bible was full of mistakes, and it didn't matter what translation you used, as long as people understood the Word of God. And so I didn't believe it. But I've got an NIV that I bought for my wife, and I looked at it. Out of all honesty, it has these verses there, but they place a line right underneath verse 8, and then they put a caption there that says, the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So they're, you know what they're saying? You have our permission to not believe verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. You have our permission that even if you read it, you don't have to believe it because we don't think God said it. And I say, woe be to them. He that taketh away from these words, I will take away his name out of my book. Isn't that what God said? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Now, what they don't tell you is, and I am not qualified, I'm not going to stand here and give you manuscript evidence because I'm not qualified to teach on manuscript evidence. But I will tell you that what they didn't tell you is that there are a lot of early manuscripts and there are a lot of ancient witnesses that do say that those verses belong there. I just believe they do. This verse is gone. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That verse is completely gone. And why is that important? Because this deals with P, uh, Philip's dealing with the Ethiopian eunuch. And they, they, he, I mean, Philip jumped up in the chariot. They were reading Isaiah 53. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. And, and the eunuch said, who's this talking about? And he went to preach to him Jesus. Amen. He's telling him about Jesus. And so you know what? They, they rode up past a little pond there. And he said, here's water. What doth prevent me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Because you know what? Baptism in water doesn't save you, does it? Your belief in Jesus Christ, that's what saves you. But if you take this verse out of the Bible, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, they just jumped down and baptized him. And they're making it look like that that saved him. Now stop and think about it. Is there a church or churches right now who believe that if you get sprinkled, dunked, or whatever in their water, you're saved? Mm, 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 mm. 
It's completely gone out of the Bible. Gone, gone, gone. This verse, completely gone. In fact, if you just want to judge whether or not a Bible's good or not, pick the Bible up and turn to 1 John 5, 7. If that verse is not there, put it down, walk away. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You see, I believe that verse belongs in the Scriptures. And they say, well, it's not in the early manuscripts, it's not in this. Listen, there's, there's enough evidence to convince me that that verse belongs in the Bible. And you know what? It just sounds like it belongs there. Amen? I believe that this verse not only has the evidence, but it has the testimony of the Holy Ghost of God to tell us that it belongs in the Scriptures. So you're starting to see right here, you're starting to see right here that there is a major, major difference between the King James Bible, the Bible that you grew up with, the Bible that your mama had, the Bible that your granddaddy had, the Bible that your forefathers who traversed from, uh, from the, over in the east and they made their way over to, uh, through this land, covered wagon, old car, didn't matter. I guarantee you they didn't have much property, but I guarantee you that most of those families had an old King James Bible. It, probably your ancestors, your great-great-granddaddy probably learned how to read by reading an old King James Bible. And you know what? It was good enough for them. You know what our preachers, you know what the great revivals in this country and those old circuit writing preachers, you know what they did? They didn't go to Bible college. They didn't have strong concordances. They didn't have 14 different commentaries and computer discs and all that stuff. They didn't have Christian radio and Christian psychology. Them old preachers, they had one thing had a King James Bible. And they just went out, and God put it in their heart to just believe what the Bible said. And they believed the Word of God, and they preached it. And I'm telling you that God wrought a great work in this nation as a result of men who believed this old King James Bible. And so, no wonder the devil hates it so much, and he's working so hard, to get the King James out of the church, out of the colleges, out of the ministries. He's working fiercely. So he says, I'm going to give you these other versions. And I've cut some things out that I don't like, and I've changed some things that I don't like. Now, I will say this, that in the NIV, the New American Standard, the New King James, and others, I believe that they contain portions of the Word of God. In many cases, they, are, they have some of the same wording there. But for the most part, the Word of God. And remember, one drop of clean water doesn't purify a dirty glass. But one drop of dirt contaminates a clean glass. And that's all it takes. It, the Bible says if a man offends the law in one point, He's guilty of what? All. Oh. So, you know, the way God sees this thing, it's either pure or it's not. There's not degrees of purity in God's eyes. Amen? There are not degrees of purity in God's eyes. And so if God said that the words of the Lord are pure words, he means, and that he would preserve them pure forever, he means that there are zero mistakes in the Bible and there will never be one mistake, one error in the Scriptures. Not one. And that is what I believe concerning the Bible. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. Now, we've been focusing on all of the verses that the other translations have omitted from the scriptures that the King James has always had. Here is what, now when the NIV committee, when those men who helped translate the New International Version of the Bible, they, uh, they sat down and they wrote out a book as sort of an, an apology for what it was that they had done to the Scriptures. And, and they called it the NIV, the making of a translation. In that book, the authors, the editors, actually accused the King James translators of violating Scripture by adding these verses to the Bible. Their quote is, the KJV adds to and so alters the Word of God. 
So you know what I say to that? I mean, somebody's not telling the truth here. The King James translator said, this is the word of God. We have everything in it that God said. And now the NIV translator said, oh, no, you don't. And you violated scripture by adding to it. And of course, I say they violated scripture by taking it out. Amen. But now you're going to see that they have these, these translators of the NIV and probably some others of the other versions. They, they're not just saying that the King James is not as good a translation. You'll see that they actually hate the King James Bible. Let me show you the difference. The King James says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein to you, that do, that you, you do well that you take heed. Now, what that was talking about, Peter is talking about how he was there when he heard the Lord's voice from heaven boom down and say, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. Peter went around telling everybody, he said, I heard God say, this is my beloved son. I heard the voice. It came from heaven. I heard him say it. But he said, you know what? You don't have to believe me. We have a more sure word of prophecy that will testify to you that Jesus is the Son of God. And yet the NIV says, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain. Notice that one is less than the other. So who do we believe? Thy word is true, is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Talking, that's the King James. Thy word is very true, therefore, or very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. NIV says, your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. You know what that's saying? That's saying that I have verified the Bible, and I say it's true. That's what it means. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, right? That's what it means. Thy word is true from where? From the beginning. Do you believe that God created the universe in six days? Like he said, that's true. Thy word is true from the beginning. And the NIV says all your words are true, but they have omitted from the beginning. They've taken it out of the scriptures. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. And now in verse 7, we have the doctrine of preservation. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. There is the doctrine of preservation. And yet the NIV changes the verse to say, O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us. So they have omitted the doctrine of preservation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is the King James. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And notice that in the NIV rendering, it says so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped. But it is omitted that the man of God may be perfect. Now I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. If you believe, and let me tell you what's at the core of all this Bible translation stuff, is that if, you've, if you find preachers, pastors, teachers, theologians, college professors, uh, laymen in a church who say that it's okay to use these other translations, knowing that there is a difference, a major difference between the NIV or the NASB and the King James, they will make the statement that well, no translation is perfect. They say that no translation really accurately portrays what the original Greek and Hebrew, and oh, by the way, we're not even sure what the original Greek and Hebrew said because all we have is copies, and we're pretty sure that there are errors in those copies, and so what they're really saying is that for 4,000 years now, there has never been a perfect Bible. Well, that's what they're saying. So since they believe that there are errors and mistakes in the Bible, since they believe that they don't have a perfect Bible, therefore, if you don't have a perfect Bible and the Bible makes you perfect, then if you have an imperfect Bible, what will the Bible make you imperfect? That's exactly right. Do we believe God or men? Now the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Do you believe that? Say amen. Every man is capable of telling things that are not true. We have a fallen, sinful nature. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all 
things. Isn't that the truth? Amen? And it doesn't matter how long you've been saved, how glorified, sanctified, holified you are, you still have a sin nature, and your heart is still desperately wicked, deceitful. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, you wouldn't be able to tell the truth. Somebody, I mean, that's just the truth, right? You kind of get an idea of what kind of preacher I am. Amen? So what do we believe, God or men? If God says one thing, and man says, oh, no, 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 you can't believe that, then rationality should say, well, we should believe God. But you see, what's coming out of our pulpits and out of our Bible colleges is, yeah, we know your Bible says that, but let us tell you that that probably shouldn't be in there. Or that was translated incorrectly. Or in the original Hebrew, it doesn't, or that is a, 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 a textual variant, and it probably shouldn't be in the Bible to begin, begin with. Well, look at it. The Bible says, thy word is very pure. That is what God said. He said it's very pure. And yet, the NIV committee said there are mistakes in the transmission of text. So God said, there are no impurities in the Bible. The NIV committee says, there are mistakes in the Bible. So who do we believe? The word of the Lord endureth forever. It means that it was it will always be perfect. And yet the NIV committee says the Bible is the words of men, a literary production. Well, I thought it was the word of God. Amen? I thought God's what God said. God said it was his word. NIV committee says it's man's word. Every word of God is pure. That's what God said. J.B. Phillips of the Phillips Bible said, I felt, abandoned, I, felt, I felt bound to abandon that God dictated every word from cover to cover attitude. Now, God said that every word of God is pure. Man said, I don't think God said all these things. Who do we believe? The words of the Lord are pure words. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. That is what God said. Man said, every member of the panel was conscious that some of its decisions were in no sense certain. That's the New English Bible Translating Committee. In other words, God said, it's positive, it's sure. You can, hey, listen, you can lay your head down at night and know that this is the inspired, infallible Word of God. That is what God said. But man said, we're not really that sure. Mm. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Calvin Linton of the NIV committee says the Bible is, quote, God's message and not his words. He believes that the Bible is the wrong side of a beautiful embroidery. The picture is still there, but knotted, blurry, not beautiful, not perfect. He calls Christians amusingly uninformed who presume the Holy Spirit dictated the actual words of the text of the original writers. He's saying that you people sitting here tonight are stupid and uninformed, and you poor people, you just haven't gone to Bible college is your problem. You haven't gone to seminary, and you haven't read my book, because I said that it's not the Word of God. And so you just, you just poor people. You know what that is? It's called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus said, I hate it. And that word means conquering the laity. And that is at the basis of all the mystery religions where the priest or the preacher or the prophet or the guru or the medicine man, what he says goes. And there is no sure word to back him up. He says, God told me that you're to bring your daughter here for us to sacrifice. And you know what? The people did it. Isn't that something? So when you have a man standing behind the pulpit, who says, you don't really have the word of God in your hands. But I will tell you what he said. That's mystery religion, doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That's what it is. Here is what the, in the book, the NIV, the making of a contemporary translation, here is what they said. Listen to the hate that they have for the King James. Do not give them a loaf of bread, 
covered with an inedible, impenetrable crust, fossilized by three and a half centuries. For any preacher or theologian who loves God's Word to allow that Word to go on being misunderstood because of the veneration of an archaic, not understood version of four centuries ago is inexcusable and almost unconscionable. Do you hear the hate in this man's voice for the old authorized Bible? Mm. Now, how many of you recognize this symbol? Oh, yeah, you pull out a dollar. It's there, right? It's the mark of the New World Order, that eye and that capstone. Notice that that eye is illuminated. That represents a, a, a mystic uh, teaching that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden that man has a third eye in him somewhere, and it needs to be opened. Have you heard of that? teaching before. Have you ever seen a woman from India who bears that religious mark where upon her forehead that is a symbol that her third eye, her inner consciousness has been opened up and that's what this symbol represents. It is a mark and, and notice there on your dollar bill it says Anuit Coeptus Novus Ordo Seclorum which means he favors the undertaking of a new world Order. And that is, that is the conspiracy that the devil is driving at right now. He's trying to bring a new world order system. There are videos and books all over this table that talk about bringing in how the devil is bringing in, in various ways, the new world order. I believe he's using the Bible translations to do it. In the King James, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Hey, somebody, somebody say amen to that, right? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And yet notice that the NIV is trying to get you to understand that God is bringing in, or the New English Bible, that God is trying to bring in a new order. By the way, that's what Hitler called his reign over Germany and his future reign over the world. He called it the new order. In the King James, the Bible says, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation, talking about when Jesus came and brought in the New Testament. And yet the NIV called it the time of the new order. So I believe the devil is saying that he's bringing in, and there's even a Bible called God's Word for a new age. I believe it's a new age Bible, don't you? Now watch this. This eye and this capstone, I pulled this graphic. Notice the relationship that the eye, the illuminated eye and the capstone has with various religious ideas. In fact, what we're seeing going on in this world is that the devil is bringing all the components of all the religions in the world. And we know from the scriptures that there's going to be a new world order political system and a new world order religious system. And it's going to be a combining of all of the religions of the world into one. That's what that represents. I found this cover on Science Digest. Notice the illuminated eye and the capstone. Notice there at the bottom there it says genius awakened. It's talking about illumination of that third eye. Forbes magazine. Notice the illumination there. Notice the caption, the coming light years. Notice that it's all talking about a time of illumination. Now that's called, let me go back to that slide for a minute. That's called the capstone of a pyramid. The capstone of the pyramid. So if I were to reference for you something about the capstone, if you were in a secret society such as Freemasonry, or you were in some Illuminati organized group, and they speak in a different language, they use a symbolic language when they speak. It's called doublespeak. And the word they say, that they say may mean something to everybody else, but it means something else to those who are illuminated and initiated into the same mystery religion they are. So when you hear... And I'll show you this tomorrow night. When you hear a president stand up before Congress and talking about a new world order, he's talking in a secret language that he knows and some other people know, but most everybody else will not know. And I'll show you that tonight. The coming. So remember that capstone thing. God said in Isaiah 28, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone. Now, let me ask you a question. You saw that graphic there. The graphic has the capstone where? The top or the bottom? It's at the top, right? Now, God said that he lays in Zion a foundation stone. Where's the foundation stone? The top or the bottom? It's on the bottom, isn't it? Right? 
a tried stone, a precious cornerstone at the bottom, a sure foundation. In Psalm 118, the Bible says, The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. But Isaiah said that that's on the foundation, right? And then the King James, 1 Peter 2 says, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, still on the foundation. And yet the NIV says that Jesus is the capstone. Wow. Listen, Jesus is not that third eye, illuminated eye in that calfstone boat. Amen. There it is right there. Mystic symbols. I got a screen full of different types of symbols here. Vera Alder, a modern witch and author of a book called Understanding the New Witch. I call it New Witch because it rhymes with sewage. You agree with that? Say amen. amen. Understanding the New Witch. She says, quote, symbols are used to conceal certain knowledge from the masses. In other words, the secret elect have a symbol, and when they use that symbol, they know what it means. But the masses, the people who are driving up and down the road or watching television or reading a magazine or buying a product or reading a book, they don't know what that symbol means. But the people who put it there do, right? So let's concentrate on a symbol called the triketra. The triketra. Okay, kind of get this image in your mind of what it looks like because if you will pick up a copy of the New King James Version of the Bible, you will more than likely find this symbol on that Bible. Now, let me, let me say this out of fairness. I know that in most places, the New King James Version matches perfectly with the King James Bible. And I've had people come to me and say, Mike, I have a New King James. What do you think about that? Let me just kind of share with you. Number one, I just believe in the King James, okay? What I see in the New King James is an attempt to still remove people from what I believe is the standard, which is the King James Bible. It's basically one stepping stone to get them to come down from what I believe is the pure Word of God. Now, let me show you some things about the New King James Version. Number one, hell is omitted 22 times. So a Jehovah's Witness could come to your door and say, hell doesn't mean a place on fire, it means the grave. And they could go to a New King James Bible in 22 places and prove it to you. The word blood is omitted 23 times. The word repent taken out 44 times. The word heaven is removed 50 times. God, the phrase God is omitted 51 times. Lord is omitted 66 times. The words devil, damnation, Jehovah, New Testament are not found in the New King James. Now hold on a minute. God's own personal name, Jehovah, is not found in the New King James Version of the Bible. To me, that's just not right. Amen? It's just not right. So I decided to look at what that tri-catcher meant. Now, uh, I have with me this week, I brought my wife and two of my children. We decided to go to the mall here in Topeka. And every time I go to the mall like that, I always like to go to the bookstore. I like to see books. I like to read books. And, and I just happen to walk by, and I promise you, you can do this just about every time. I don't encourage you to buy them. But if you'll walk by the New Age section or the occult section there in any big-name bookstore, pick up a book on witchcraft or Wicca, and I promise you, almost without fail, you will find this symbol on that book. In fact, we were there the other day. I went into the bookstore. I looked at the New Age section right on the top shelf. Facing me was a new book that I'd never seen before on witchcraft, and there that symbol was right there. This woman by the name of Lorna Roberts has a website called Triketra Journeys. She says that it represents the power of three witches united together. This is used in witchcraft to represent the feminine deity. There is a, there is a, a more secret symbolization in this Triketra that I will not deal with tonight. It is very vulgar and very nasty, but there is a, wiz, there is a reason why feminists and witches use this symbol. You'll find it under, I have, in fact, I have a copy of this book called The Aquarian Conspiracy. The Aquarian Conspiracy was a book written by Marilyn Ferguson back in the, um, it was written in the late 70s, came out in 1980. It's still being published now. You can still get a copy of it now. Marilyn Ferguson, and the book is about this thick. It's a very thick book. And she, and in this book, she has detailed 
what all the New Age movement and all the Aquarians and all the Illuminatis and all the secret societies, she's basically spilled the beans on what they're trying to do and how that the New Age movement has gone into the, the schoolhouses. Do you believe that? Say amen. The New Age movement has gone into the government sectors. It's in our government. And she said that it's in the churches too. And notice that she used this symbol and I'm going to show you why here in a moment, why this symbol is so prominent and why this symbol is very important to the New Age movement. You'll find it on Ouija boards. Stop and think about this for a minute. You see, in God's religion, God has given us a sure word. And so all of us here tonight, if I say that Christ died on the cross for your sins and that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you could sit there and say, amen, preacher, because your Bible says the same thing that my Bible does, doesn't it? You see, there's agreement. Can two walk together except they be agreed, the Bible says. Now, if, I, if I'm the only one who had a Bible and you people were not allowed to have a Bible, remember Roman, Roman Catholicism? It's a mystery religion. You know why? Because the priests say, we're the only ones who really should have a Bible. And they, listen, they, they let Catholics have Bibles now, but they don't like it. They still tell them, don't try to read it. We'll tell you what it means. That's mystery religion. So if I was the only one who had a Bible, and none of you had a Bible, and I said, oh, the Bible says here that you have to pay me $10,000 a week. God said so. Where's the standard? How do you know that I'm telling you the truth? You don't, do you? You don't know. So think about it. You know what Ouija board is? By the way, I encourage you, those of you here, those of you watching this video, do not let your kids play with Ouija boards. Do not let your kids go to somebody's house that has a Ouija board. Amen? You're going to lose your kids. So you know what a Ouija board is? It's the devil's version of the Bible. Because the person sits there, he takes the, I guess it's a mouse, I don't know what it is. But they hold that thing and they go into some trance and then the devils from hell begin to move their hands and begin to write and spell out words. Boy, that's dangerous as a loaded pistol, amen? It's dangerous. Don't let your kids into that stuff. But notice the trichetra there. You see it there on another Ouija board, the trichetra there, the most prominent symbol there. Oh, by the way, there's a symbol up there on the upper right-hand corner that you've probably seen before. It's called the yin-yang. And the yin-yang is a Chinese symbol. Listen to this. Notice that it has a black dot in a white field and a white dot in a black field. And the Chinese philosophy of yin yang says that there is a little good in all evil and a little evil in all good. So you know what? The Hegelian dialect is seen in the symbol of the yin yang. It said, now remember what God said. God said in good there is no evil and in evil there is no good. That there is a difference between holy and unholy and yet this philosophy says there isn't a difference between holy and unholy. Wow. Here's another one. This uh, Ouija board is actually seen on a television show. Notice the symbol. And the television show is called Charmed. Have you ever heard of that show? I hope you haven't sat down and watched it, but I guarantee you, your kids or your grandkids have seen it. It's a very popular... In fact, witchcraft and the wicked religion is exploding in teenage girls right now. It's exploding in them. And it's exploding in church teenage girls. And there's even a book called Teen Witch written by a Wiccan to teenage girls. And part of that book tells them that if your mom and daddy go to church, I'm going to teach you how you can sit down with your parents and get them to accept your new religion. mm 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 mm, -mm. So they watch TV shows called Charmed, and they watch TV shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and all of these other things, Teen Witch, and, and uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Man, my, 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 my. Where have we gone in this country? We used to be a country of the Bible. Now we're a country of witchcraft. Notice the symbol there. 
And it's on a book that witches use called a book of shadows. And a book of shadows is like a witch's diary. They write down their dreams. They write down um, uh, uh, spells that they have learned or spells that they have used that work and so on. It says most neo-pagan religions are based on custom and experience rather than the written word. And that's interesting because we have a detailed description of what the false prophet is doing in the last days in the book of Revelation. He is using signs and wonders. He is using experiences and entertainment to get people to follow this beast system that's coming in the last days because he has successfully removed the written word from the hearts of people. And it's all related to this symbol that I'm showing you tonight. How many of you remember a group, a rock group called Led Zeppelin. You remember them? Led Zeppelin, the, the lead singer, Jimmy Page, was a follower of a man by the name of Aleister Crowley. And I wish I, had, I could teach hours on the influence that Aleister Crowley, a warlock, a black magician, has had upon the media industry in this country, upon, I mean, music, movies, television, books, you name it. These men were followers. The Beatles followed Aleister Crowley. A lot of rock groups, a lot of rock singers, Film producers follow Aleister Crowley. Jimmy Page actually bought Aleister Crowley's mansion and moved into it. And he uses this symbol. Notice the symbol there that they use. This is from their website. They use it at their rock concerts. Now, Aleister Crowley designed a set of tarot cards. And this is the tarot card called the Hierophant. And I'm going to explain to you tonight what a Hierophant is in relation to the mystery religions that are coming on the earth right now. But I want you to notice that in his hand, he is holding a wand with the Triketra symbol on it. Now that is very, very important. I want you to get a hold of that. I also want you to notice something with me as you look at this tarot card. You'll see that on the four corners of the card, you see an eagle, you see a man, you see a lion, and you see an ox. Somebody tell me in the Bible where those are from. They're from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was allowed to see, John was allowed to see, the throne of God with God sitting on the throne and supporting that throne were four living creatures, four beasts. One of them was an ox, one of them was an eagle, one of them was a man, and one of them was a lion. Now stop and think about this. They're saying that the hierophant is God. Do you know who this is really? It's the devil. Notice that he has positioned him, himself to sit in the seat of God. Notice that he's holding the triketra in his hand. And I'm going to show you why. By the way, there is even a supposedly Christian rock group who uses this symbol. You'll see it on churches. You'll see it in ministries all over the place. Now, the name of the group is called Avalon. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit of something about Mike Hogan. I've been raised in church all my life, but that doesn't mean I don't have a mean streak, all right? I remember when I was a teenager and a young person, I had a fascination with things that were slightly of the occult nature. I used to read the Lord of the Rings books. I would, I would have been fascinated at the Harry Potter stuff when I was a teenager, when I was a kid. I used to read all the myths and legends concerning King Arthur and Merlin the Magician. And when I saw this group called Avalon, I knew exactly what it was. You see, Avalon in the legend of King Arthur and Merlin the Magician, Avalon was a mystical island that existed that was the bridge to the underworld. Now, what does a Christian group have to do with the theme of the bridge to hell? And notice the symbol that they are using to do it with. I don't believe the devil's got all his eggs in one basket. I believe that he's using Bible translations. I believe he's using Christian music. Well, that's just what I believe, right? I mean, the devil wants to try to get into the church. This is how he's doing it. In fact, I found three different copies of this tarot card, and I know the graphics are not that clear, but on all three tarot cards, this hierophant priest is holding a triketra. Let me tell you who this hierophant is and what he represents in the mystery religions. It says he teaches matters of faith, religion, belief, and morality. He is a wise teacher full of esoteric and occult knowledge. Esoteric means secret or hidden doctrines. He aids in understanding the occult mysteries. He holds, now notice this, he holds the keys 
of transformation. What was he holding in his hand? The triketra. Notice that they say he holds the keys. The triketra is the key to transformation. He oversees the initiation of people into the mystery religions of ancient Babylon. Remember when I said that the false prophet doesn't force everybody to take the mark. He causes them. Which means that this world is being taken on a ride toward initiation into the new world order beast power religion that's coming onto the earth. According to fame occultist Elise Bailey, she said there was no question that to listen to what she said, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance. In other words, she says we know that we must get the general public at least familiar with the mystery religion. And she said these mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of what? The church. She said, because Christ is the hierophant of the first and second initiations, he will administer the first initiation in the inner sanctuary of the church. Now you say, you know what? That's just some old occult thing. And you know what? None of that's true. And you know what? Yeah, I believe that it's all false and that's not going to happen. But let me tell you something. If a thief called you on the phone and said, at midnight, I'm coming to your house to rob you blind, you, you could say, well, you know what? You're a thief and you're probably lying. Right? You could say, you're a thief and you're probably, oh, this is a prank call. But you know what? The prudence says, and you know what the Word of God says? Sit up and wait at midnight. And if he comes in, I'll let you handle the rest. Amen? Okay? You figure out what to do with him when he gets in there. But you know what? You can believe him or not. But they said that they were coming into the church to begin the initiation process. I say that God's people had better be on their guard and watching and waiting because our adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I promise you, they said they're going to try to get it in the church. They're going to try to get it in the church. And then you can see in this triketra three numbers. Six, six, six. Now, Thomas Nelson are the people who published the New King James Version of the Bible. This is the explanation that they use of why this symbol is on their Bible. They say that the triketra is an ancient symbol for the Trinity. It comprises three woven arcs, distinct yet equal and inseparable, symbolizing that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct yet equal persons and indivisibly one God. So what they're saying is, is that the Trikentra is an artwork that tries to show you the Trinity. Hang on a minute. The Word of God says, we ought not think that the Godhead or the Trinity is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. So man said, we have come up with a piece of artwork that says that it shows the Trinity. And yet God said, don't bother. God said, do not grave artwork to try to show the Godhead. Because number one, we can't do it. And I just think that God is wise enough to recognize and know that this symbol would be used in a secret way as a device to transform the church into a new world order system. Now, you've heard me preach on Bible numerics this week. I tell you that there is, a, I, I believe in the, the order of the Bible. We have four books in the Bible called the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's interesting that there are exactly four verses in the Bible that talk about another Gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, 4, Galatians 1, 6. Paul warned us, he said it over and over and over, that though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so, now, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, let him be accursed. So Bible is warning us about a false gospel system coming into the church. Now I'm going to take you, remember, let's get back to this Hegelian dialect thing here. And let's remember how it works. You have God's way on one side, the devil's way on the other, and he must bring God's people over to his way with a new synthetic doctrine. The Hegelian dialect was evident in Genesis chapter 3, and I'll show that to you. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. How many words there? One, two, three, four. So you know what I think? I think that this new false gospel has to do with what Lucifer said, Yea, hath God said. In other words, you know what he's saying? He's saying, did God really say this? He is introducing the opposite of faith, which is doubt. Now, let me tell you something. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. God's grace is his part. Our faith is our part. And faith basically means that you believe what God said, right? You believe what God said. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? Christian radio? Well, maybe. Christian music? Jerry Springer? No. He said that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. And so you know what? If you don't believe the Word, you have no faith. Amen? If you don't believe the word, you have no faith. You see, you say, well, I believe the Bible says Jesus died for my sins. Well, that's good. But then you say, I don't believe that God created the universe in six days, 6,000 years ago. That's not good. Because where do you draw the line on what you believe from the Bible and what you don't believe from the Bible? Remember what Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every Word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So God said, Adam, thou shalt not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that thou doest, thou shalt surely die. Adam transmitted that to his wife. The devil shows up in that form of the serpent, and he says, Eve, I looked in the original manuscripts, and in some of the original manuscripts, what Adam told you was in the Bible is not really in there. You see, because in a lot of these translations, they will put a little mark there next to a verse that is obviously missing or a part of a verse that's missing, and they'll put a little notation down there that basically says the earliest manuscripts do not have this verse. You know what they're saying? Did God really say this? Yea, hath God said. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, notice in Genesis 2, 16, God said, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So he's not even really quoting God right here. And then he said, But of the fruit of the tree, this is God saying this. No, this is the devil, excuse me. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall neither eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Excuse me, this is Eve saying this. You know what Eve has just done? She's added to the word of God. God didn't say that they couldn't touch it. In fact, God told Adam to take care of the garden, didn't he? Adam was responsibility, and if you take care of plants, you got to touch them, right? But God never did say you couldn't touch them. Eve added to the word of God. So already we're in trouble. You got the devil on one side saying, we're not sure God said this. Then you got the pride of Eve kicking up, adding to it. And boy, folks, we've got a, we've got a recipe for disaster right here. Because in none of this is God's word being accurately represented. The devil's not accurately representing it. And Eve, the church, is not accurately representing it either. So we have a recipe for disaster. But then the devil shows up in verse 4 and says, The serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You know what he did? He changed, or he added, one word. God said, ye shall surely die. The devil said, ye shall not surely die. God said this, the devil said this. And the new synthetic doctrine says that we're going to hear God's voice in here somewhere. I'm telling you, it's not true. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then you're what? eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing 
good and evil. So I believe that the devil, from, since Genesis 3 on, has been marching mankind down a road of trying to bring him to a new consciousness that will regard Lucifer as the God of the universe. Now, I've spent all this time telling you about what is in all the other translations, the conspiracy that's going on to try to transform the church. And I'm going to end this video, I'm going to end this talk with what I believe the scriptures tell us what, that you can believe about the Bible. You see, I am limited as a Christian to only believe what God tells me to believe. And if God doesn't tell me to believe it, then I'm not supposed to believe it. If, if God says it's this way, then I'm supposed to believe that it's this way. If God said it's not this way, then I'm not supposed to believe this way. And the Psalm 118 says, it is better to, put, to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Hey, isn't that what David found out? Remember when David numbered the armies and God gave him a choice? God said, you can either let man judge you, you can let me judge you. Now, with most people, I mean, that would kind of make you afraid, right? Because God's bigger than men. But you know what David recognized? David recognized that men are wicked. And they'll be mean to him, but God has mercy. Somebody say amen. So it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And I am standing here tonight. You're sitting here watching me. You're watching this video. You're saying, who in the world is Mike Hoggard? And why is he an authority over me? I'm not an authority over you. Not in any way, shape, or form. And I do not speak with the voice of authority. I'm going to let God speak for himself. Because if he can't tell you, then who am I? Right? I'm going to show you that the Bible teaches, number one, inspiration. Number two, preservation. And number three, translation. Let's walk down this road. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. It means God breathed it. Theopneustos, the original Greek. God breathed the very words that those disciples, that those prophets wrote. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So what that means is, is that where the word is, the breath of the Holy Spirit also breathes life into it. Amen? And I have put my words in my mouth. This is the transmission process. And I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand that I may plant the heavens. Notice that God said, I've put my words in thy mouth. My words, thy mouth, is the doctrine of inspiration. Jeremiah, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So it's not Jeremiah's words, is it? It's God's words. That's inspiration, the method of transmission. Now, let me give you a, a typical doctrinal faith statement that says we believe the scriptures to be the inspired, inerrant word of God in the original manuscripts. Now, let me tell you that I believe this statement as we're dealing with it right now. I believe that when Jeremiah took that pen and he wrote on that papyra what God had told him to write, that was the inspired word of God. Do you believe that? Say amen. It was, in, I mean, it was good for them people back then, wasn't it? It was inspired. So I, as this statement currently stands right now, I believe that the original manuscripts were the inspired word of God. Now, but it doesn't stop there. We must deal with preservation. Psalm 12, here again, I'm going to let God talk. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God is teaching us the doctrine of preservation. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That's what God said, right? Jesus said it. He said it wouldn't pass till it's all fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That is the doctrine of preservation. Amen? Amen. All scripture, and I pointed this out a while ago, all scripture not was given, but is given by inspiration of God. 
present tense. It was present tense in Moses' day. It was present tense in Paul's day. And it's present tense in Mike Hoggard's day. The scripture is still given by inspiration of God. And you know that word given? That's a gift word in the Bible, isn't it? Do you believe that the Bible is a gift of the Spirit of God? I do. I really do. I believe, in, in fact, I didn't, I didn't earn this. I didn't earn the words of life that Peter talked about. I don't deserve it. I don't have it coming. Amen? You agree with me? Amen? You don't know me, but you ought to agree with me. I'm telling you, I don't deserve this book. God gave it to me as a gift. The gift of his Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you from the scriptures itself that this Bible is a gift of the Spirit of God. You're going to like this. So that's the doctrine of preservation. Now let's go back to this statement we looked at. We believe the scriptures to be the inspired and errant word of God in the original manuscripts. Now, you will find this. In fact, if you go to websites or you will call colleges, Christian ministries, organizations, churches, denominations, and ask for a copy of their faith statement, almost without fail, they will have the, almost the identical wording in that they say, we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God in the original manuscripts, and then they put a period there. But you see, what they're not telling you is, is that in our colleges, in our denominations, in our Christian leadership ministries, radio ministries, TV ministries, book ministries, you name it, Christian youth organizations, they, re they say we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God in the original manuscripts, but we don't have any original manuscripts. And we believe that errors have crept into the manuscripts, the copies since then. So right now we really don't have the inerrant word of God. And they have no scriptural evidence to support the statement. So you remember the idea that if God said it's this way and man said it's this way and man contradicted God, who's right? God is right. Let God be true and every man a liar. And I've, I've been in discussions, debates, heated arguments, with preachers and people who will say, you know, Mike, the Bible does have mistakes in it. It's got errors in it. It's got all this. There are verses that are not translated right. It's wrong here. It's wrong there. We have evidence. We have manuscript evidence that says that there's mistakes in it. But I've never had anybody give me, show me one verse in the Bible and give me any indication where God ever said that his word would ever corrupt in one small way. Nobody's ever shown me the verse. In fact, you can't. You can't show me the verse in the Bible that says the Bible's got a mistake in it. You know what I can show you? Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. They'll say, you know what? The renderings between 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles, that there are passages in there that don't agree with each other, and that proves that there are mistakes in the Bible. You know what? There are no mistakes. Let me give you something. You might want to write this down. This will help you, all right? Rule number one there are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if you think you found one, refer to rule number one. All right? Because I'm going to show you why there are not mistakes in the Bible. There are mistakes in your mind. There's not mistakes in the Bible doctrine. There's mistakes in our doctrine. You know what? I don't think I've got it all right as far as my doctrine. In fact, I'm, I'm probably wrong somewhere. Probably some of you would sit there and tell me where I'm wrong, right? But you know what? This Bible's right. Let me tell you what God did. In 1 Peter chapter 2, the Bible says, in verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief corner, stone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Notice that Peter is saying here that if you just believe Jesus, you'll never really be confused. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he's precious. You know what I believe? I believe this Bible's precious. Listen, I can tell you the testimony of Mike Hargrave, but I'm telling you, this, this book saved my life, literally. It's precious to me. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. 
So you know what you will probably find if you look hard enough? You'll probably find two verses that look like they're saying the same thing, but there's differences between them, and you'll say, you know what, that proves there's mistakes in the Bible. And you know what I say to you? If you go to the Bible looking for mistakes, God will let you see some that you think are mistakes because you, you'll be like Israel. Israel couldn't see the Messiah because Jesus was standing in the way. And you know what people, you know what our theologians and our Bible colleges and our preachers are doing now? They can't see the Word of God because the Bible's standing in their way. And they have tripped and been offended over the very book that God said is the Word of God. They're called stumbling stone verses. So rule number one, no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if you think you found one, refer to rule number one. Here's what they say. Well-trained textual critics operating on the... And boy, this sounds real good. Well-trained textual critics operating on the basis of sound methodology are able to rectify almost all misunderstandings that might result from manuscript error. Hmm, sounds good, doesn't it? But, you know, that almost all just doesn't quite cut it with me. And number one, who are the well-trained textual critics and why are they criticizing the Bible to begin with? And number two, what is the sound methodology... Mm, Isaiah 29, 11, And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. That's what's coming out of our Bible colleges. You can't really understand the Bible, so don't even bother. Let me tell you about these original manuscripts. You know what these original manuscripts were written on, by, by and large? They were written on a, a thing called papyrus. And I, I understand a little bit about that. It was a, a grass-like plant that grew in layers, and they would take it and split it apart and weave it together and all that stuff. And actually, the word papyrus is where we get the word paper from, okay? So they were writing. And, you know, I've, I've had this Bible now for a few years, and, and kind of like yours, the pages are starting to get worn on it, right? But, you know, just because my, my pages rip and they get dirty and cruddy and ripped and sometimes I lose one every now and then, that doesn't negate the effect of the Word of God. It's still there, amen? So most of these were written on papyrus, and papyrus is grass, Right? Notice what God said. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So you know what? God never one time promised that the original manuscripts would be preserved forever because they're written on grass. And he said grass will fade away. So I'm telling you, God was not interested in preserving manuscripts. He preserved his word and the word still stands even though the originals are no longer there. And I want you to notice that flowers fade too, don't they? So you know what's coming out of most of our ministries and most of our Bible colleges is that they believe in a Bible that has faded away. And the Bible says, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a what? Fading flower. You'll see them get up behind the pulpits and the lecterns and they say, Oh, praise God, we believe that, uh, we, we don't have, I, I believe in the inerrant word of God, but we don't have it in our hands now. That's what they're saying. And then thirdly, I believe in translation. And I believe it according to the word of God. I believe that the Bible was translated correctly and I'm going to prove it to you. And I hear this from people all the time. No translation is, is inspired, only the original languages. Again, nobody has ever shown me one verse to support the fact that the Bible cannot be translated perfectly. Nobody's ever shown me that. Not one verse. In fact, I'm going to show you verses that will teach you otherwise. God said in Isaiah 28, 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. So you know what God said? God said that he would speak in another language. A tongue is a language, isn't it? God said that he would speak in another tongue. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is quoting that, and notice what he says. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. So God said, according to these two witnesses, that he would speak in other languages. Do you believe that? Say amen. So the Partial fulfillment of that was in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and just began to speak in other tongues as what? The Spirit gave them utterance. So you know what those men were doing? Philip and all these other guys, they walked out there and they began to preach Joel. They, Peter said, this is that. And they were preaching the Word of God, not in the original Hebrew. 
They were preaching, if you count them, there's 17 different languages that they were preaching the Word of God in. And who gave them the utterance? The Holy Ghost did. And those men standing there, they said, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Those people there were the recipients of God translating the Bible. They got saved because God translated the Bible. You know what? I got saved because God translated the Bible. Did you? Somebody say amen. Now watch this. The word translation, we use that word to mean the, the go-between from one language to another. But the Bible uses the word interpretation. Notice at Genesis, and they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by a what? An interpreter. I'm going to look at this word interpret just so that you get it. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tikal, eupharsin. This is the what? The interpretation of the thing. Daniel is translating the language. Daniel 5, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the what? The interpretation shall be clothed with scarlet. Behold, a virgin shall be... Uh, with child, and they shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted. God with us. Notice that God is giving you the interpretation of what Emmanuel means. He's, Emmanuel is a language that you and I do not understand. It's Hebrew. We don't speak Hebrew. And yet God is saying, I'm going to translate it for you and tell you what it means. Talitakumi, which is being interpreted. Damsel. Notice the use of the word. Going from one language to the next. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted, the place of the skull. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi. And see, we don't use it. That's not an English word, is it? It's a Hebrew word. But it's being interpreted, master. So do you now know a Hebrew word? Because it was interpreted for you. And who interpreted it? God did. John 1, 41, who he first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought unto him Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation, a stone. I know I'm laying out a lot of evidence for you, but I want you to get this. Siloam, which is by interpretation, sent. So when the Bible uses the word interpret, it means going from one language to another. Now remember what the gifts of the Spirit are. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. God is saying that it is in fact, in spite of what all the theologians have told me, in spite of what of all my preacher friends have tried to tell me, that no translation, no interpretation of the Bible can be as good as the original. God said that it's actually a gift of the Spirit to be able to interpret from one language to another. Somebody say amen. In fact, I'm going to show you something else that will just make the little doodads run up and down your spine. Because God actually laid down a formula of interpretation. And when an unknown tongue is given, watch this, 1 Corinthians 14. He said, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Except he what? Interpret. That the church may receive edifying. You know what he's talking about there? He's saying, if I were to get up here in the, with the, an original manuscript in Hebrew and read it to you, are you going to get anything out of that? You know what doomed millions and millions of people to hell all during the, the dark ages was that the Roman Catholic Church stood there with their Latin Bible reading the Word of God in Latin and not telling anybody what it meant. And people died and went to hell as a result of it, didn't they? Now watch this. Because God said, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. Let me ask you a question. How many languages was the Bible originally written in? Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. 
What does this verse say? If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. And that by course. And then how many should interpret those three unknown languages? One. I think it's neat that God has taken three languages unknown to you and I and I believe that they are interpreted in this one book. Do you believe that? Somebody say amen. I believe that. That God has chosen to take this old boy. I, I say I'm from Festus, Missouri, but I was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Thank you, Pine Bluff. Thank you very much, all right? God's taken this old boy from Pine Bluff. And by the way, we left Arkansas before the Clintons got in. So that just, okay. I had to throw that in there, okay. God took this old boy from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, speaks like this. And those three languages that I would have never known, God translated them into this Bible right here. And I read this and I got saved because I believed what God said. And it's a gift of his Holy Spirit. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private what? Interpretation. And remember what Joseph said? Do not interpretations belong to God. So if you tell me that my translation of the Bible did not, is not the inspired word of God, I'll tell you that the Bible says you're wrong and that the translation, the interpretation does belong to God. And they say, I do not believe that a translation can be inspired. And let me tell you something. If the breath of the Holy Ghost of God does not breathe through the book that you read, how can you be saved? Now I'm going to close this with this. I'd like for you to take your Bible, your King James Bible, and turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. There's something there that I want to share with you tonight. Oh, no, by the way, why the King James Bible? Because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, where the word of a king is, there is power. Let me tell you something. This is the year 2004. Do you know what happened this year, 400 years ago? King James of England declared this in 1604, that a translation be made of the whole Bible as consonant as can be to the original Hebrew and Greek. This year celebrates the 400th anniversary of the proclamation by King James. And you know what? This verse is right. Where this book has been, there has been power. Amen? It was this book that built a nation and no other book. Let me teach you some things about the King James Bible. Number one, I hear people say that the King James is not copyrighted. Well, that's only partially true because the King James has what's called a royal copyright on it, in that anywhere that you go in the United Kingdom, King, the, the, the British monarch, King James put his stamp upon this Bible so that it could never be changed. And why is that important? Because a few years ago, the Sodomites over in England, they tried to sue Cambridge and Oxford University, who administered the rights of the King James. They tried to sue them to get the word Sodomite out of the Bible because they said it made them look bad. No, their sin makes them look bad. Amen? Amen? And by the way, it didn't. you know what the courts ruled? The courts ruled that as long as a monarch sits on the throne in England, this Bible cannot be changed. Somebody say amen. So you know what? For 400 years, this Bible. Now, to give you something else. Now, I'm going to read a few verses out of here, and you read along with me. I have in my hand, it's a reprint of the original 1611 King James Bible. Uh, Brother Stan showed me out here on the front. You have an actual page of that original 1611 King James Bible. I've had people say, well, you say you believe in the King James. Well, which King James do you believe in? Because the 1611 Bible is not the same as the one we have now because everybody knows it's been changed so many times. And the original 1611 Bible was written in what's called Middle English and we, nobody speaks that anymore. In fact, you can't even read it and understand it. And you know what? I believed that for a long time until I picked up this 1611 King James Bible. And I want you to follow along with me as I read from Isaiah 53. 
This is 400 years old now. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and we, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Oh, I love that, don't you? And carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his own soul, or excuse me, of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Is that what your Bible says, word for word? So you know what? It's not true. This Bible hasn't changed in 400 years. Now, there has been some revisions of the text. There are spelling errors in here, tremendous spelling errors in here. There are words that, and like in one place it says God and it should be good, or it says good, it should be God, something like that. But by, and those are printing errors. But by and large, this Bible, and you know what? In a world of constant change, I go to bed at night with knowledge, knowing that if God said he never changed, he never changes. Is that what you believe in? Somebody say amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.